My name is Ernaz Khan, and I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. I'm going to talk to you about my research with Professor Andy Taylor on a minimal scale of your model to tackle the cosmological constant problem. So let's begin. What is the cosmological constant problem? As we know, the universe is expanding and its expansion is accelerating. We also know that in the past, the universe used to be a matter dominated. And right now, it's in a period of accelerated expansion. We don't really know why it is expanding, as it is against intuition to imagine that instead of the gravitational collapse due to all the matter present, um, there appears to be a negative pressure component to the universe that is causing it to implode. The simplest way to model this is to add in a cosmological constant in Einstein's equations. But the cosmological constant actually receives contributions from the matter sector in the form of vacuum energy. When you calculate um, these, this vacuum energy, you also need to add in quantum corrections to it. And it turns out these corrections are very, very large. They can be as much as 60 orders of magnitude larger than observations would actually imply. Crucially, vacuum energy itself suffers from issues of fine tuning as well. And this is due to its sensitivity to unknown physics from higher energies. This is known as cosmological constant problem. And what I'm going to talk to you about um, in this presentation is a simple minimal scale of fuel solution to the problem in the sense that we want to have a large vacuum energy and still be able to see only a small amount of it in a stable way. So before that, what would be the simplest way to tackle the problem? Let's consider this. Think about a potential that has a minimum at V0 and a scalar field that's rolling down and approaching V0. Now imagine that the field comes to rest at this minimum and relaxes to that value. And now you can set the value of V0 to be equal to whatever you need, such that it cancels rho lambda to the exact required degree. There you go, the problem is solved. That's what you think. But Weinberg's Novo theorem actually tells us that in such solutions, V0 will also need to be fine-tuned to the same degree that rho lambda needs to be fine-tuned. So this doesn't actually solve our problem. There is a loophole though. What we can do is relax Weinberg's assumptions and dynamically cancel the large vacuum energy. These are known as self-tuning solutions um, where the field stays dynamic at the minimum or elsewhere as it cancels the vacuum energy. How much freedom does a single scalar field actually grant us though, in terms of what types of forms of um, potentials or um, kinetic functions that we see? Turns out there's already a framework to exploit in order to find this out. Horndesky theory is the most general scalar tensor theory of gravity in four dimensions that is stable. Stable here means that the resulting equations of motions are at most second order, which prevents um, runaway negative energies. It was first proposed in 1974 by Gregory Horndesky as part of his PhD thesis, but was actually revived just about 10 years ago to find self cheating solutions to exactly the problem that we've been talking about. The action, the gravitational action, is fairly complicated and it has four main Lagrangian density terms. It looks a little bit like this. Um, it is obviously a complicated Lagrangian with even more complicated equations of motion. But the main problem with this is that the full Horndesky theory modifies the speed of gravitational waves for which we have data now. And it generally tunes away any matter present that would interfere with um, structure formation, for example. But due to uh, the recent data from gravitational wave speed measurements, we can constrain Horndesky theory to just 
three terms, G2, G3, and G4. But there are further pressures on this G4 term. Um, so for simplicity and um, in order to meet observations better, we um, retain Einstein gravity for that term um, in this minimal model. What's left behind is known as the kinetic gravity braiding theory. And this is considered to be the surviving subclass of Hondeski theory. Now to our minimal model. Um, so our G2 term here is made up of a kinetic term that is non-canonical. Um, we've also got a linear potential. Um, the G3, it's proportional to square root of 2x, which is simply phi dot, or like the time derivative of phi. Now let's see how it um, alters our equations of motion in a simple way. The Friedman equation, as you can see, is um, modified by this um, energy density contribution from the field. The acceleration term here is modified by a pressure contribution from the field. And the scalar field equation is simply modified by this h dot phi dot term here, which basically is what allows the self-tuning. Um, and this h minus h to sitter term here, where h to sitter is the Hubble attractor that um, we use. And that is what will determine what the um, expansion rate at present is, despite the value of the vacuum energy density. So K here is a non-canonical kinetic term as mentioned, but what it mainly does is introduces the attractor term into our equations of motion. And despite its negative sign, it is free of ghosts. Our potential is a linear potential that simply removes or cancels vacuum energy. This G3 term introduces H dependence, as you can see here in the scalar field equation, um, and it introduces an H dependence even in the density term. Um, this is what actually allows the self-tuning to occur. So you've got three ingredients here. First is the linear potential that removes the vacuum energy density. Second is self-tuning because of the presence of H inside our Friedman equation and scalar field equation. And we've got the desitter attractor that is introduced through the kinetic term. The final in ingredient is the shift symmetry of the Lagrangian, which is known to aid in controlling quantum corrections. So, First, I'm going to show you here a plot of the attractor behavior. So on the y-axis, we've got um, our Hubble parameter, and on the x-axis, we've got time dependence. As you can see, for various initial values of the Hubble parameter and the initial field speed, um, we see a common evolution towards the attractor value. Now onto the model mechanism, and here are our main results. So in this plot, you can see um, various energy densities with time. So the first thing I want you to look at here is the vacuum energy density. So that's here at this level. The pink line is the evolution of matter. Um, so the matter is reducing as one over T squared and it's getting diluted with expansion as expected. Um, but what we will observe here is the three Planck mass square, eight square term, which is basically also the total energy, if you remember from the Friedman equations, initially follows the matter energy density. And it goes down as one over T squared at early times. And it does this despite the presence of vacuum energy. And what is actually happening behind the scenes is that the potential energy is removing rho lambda. And this is done while the field is in slow roll or um, you can say that the field is small compared to its mass scale. Now we see that this um, eight squared term um, approaches a desitter attractor asymptotically at the end of matter domination. So you've got the matter error um, replicated and now a constant 
Kassiter um, state for H, which will give rise to absolute expansion at a scale much lower than rho lambda. And now I've added in um, the kinetic energy contribution and the um, effective dark energy contribution. So what happens is the potential itself provides a driving force term inside, kinetic, inside its kinetic energy um, that is triggered near the attractor. So if you see um, kinetic energy rises very, very rapidly in this area um, to drive the effective dark energy, the green line, to the attractor value. Um, and we've also found that this attractor solution is stable under a phase transition in the value of the vacuum energy as well. So what the main thing about this is that the mechanism is novel. Um, it is different to the ones done in the original self-tuning models, and it is different to the recently proposed well-tempered models as well. Um, this mechanism has been generalized and explained further in um, this paper by Appleby and Bernardo, which was released shortly after our paper. And it actually shows that there is an existence of a wider class of self tuning models than we had previously assumed. What we can also do is scale this model such that the attractor energy density is equal to the critical energy density today. And what we get from this is that the mass scale of the field would have to be a very, very light scalar field, which corresponds to a low energy particle physics scale. And um, this is roughly similar to what you find in quintessence models as well. The model may actually be a lower energy manifestation of a high energy theory, um, because you see G3 type interactions, the box by interaction, and um, non polynomial kinetic interactions in um, models such as, um, such as that of brain cosmology. So, just to summarize, we showed that there is a simple model that can remove a large vacuum energy density and give acceleration at a much lower energy scale as required. We show that the model is theoretically viable and passes gravitational wave speed constraints, and that it also preserves a matter-dominated error, which is what a lot of scalable models tend to struggle with, and is stable under a vacuum energy phase transition. So this is the end of the talk. And presently, we are working on linear perturbations in the model to study large-scale structure formation. So I look forward to your questions. Thank you.